Welcome everyone. Today I want to make a presentation to you on the Hellenic problems in Christian theology. And when I say Hellenic problems, I am specifically referring to Hellenic philosophy and uh, secular thought, not the Hellenic culture or anything like that. Throughout history, Christian theology has gone through various developments through its uh, theologians, the ecumenical councils, and so on and so forth. And many of the heresies that were combated in history were, in fact, reflections of Hellenic philosophy in a, in a Christian clothing, in a pseudo-Christian clothing, rather. And we can see this much clearer once we kind of understand the, the terminology used and what they meant by the terminology. Uh, now, of course, these are terms that are used by Christians even today as well. But the meaning is different. What do they mean by these terms? Well, substance, for instance, and, and a lot of these different heretical views and theological views that were professed by persons in church history, they all they had different definitions of the same term. Sometimes they even had the same definitions, but then when they apply those definitions in their concepts and their philosophy, in reality, we actually saw a different understanding of that term, even if the same uh, meaning was used. And so this is why it's very difficult to kind of analyze this history without really being in the know of what the doctrines that are being defended truly are. And so it requires a lot of discernment. But in the, the, the constructs that we can see here is based on two different dichotomies, substance accident dichotomy and universal particular dichotomies. Now, we will say that these dichotomy, th these terms do exist, but whether we view them in a relationship of uh, oppositions or in that in a dialectical manner, now that's a different question. So, for example, substance was defined by a self-subsistent reality, so something that stands on its own, that it doesn't, it does not have to exist in something else in order to exist. Whereas accident was pretty much that; it's non-self-subsistent, therefore. Uh, it does not exist by itself. It exists in another substance. It's coin here is in the substance in order for it to exist. And then we have the particular universal dichotomy. Again, by the way, there have been different, you know, meanings and terms to these two, right? So, for example, uh, universal could just be a collection of particulars, right? Whereas a particular is merely the universal that is instantiated, which has these accidents in it right um that distinguish it from others again if you have read church history these are definitions that sound very similar to the definitions used by our own saints but what did they mean by this if you if you look at the waves of hellenism in history we can see where we're going with this where these people went with it so for example the first wave of hellenism came, uh, really manifested in arianism and eunomianism where uh, they pretty much, and although this doesn't really relate to the definitions used here, later waves are going to be related to these definitions. Uh, this way of Hellenism, because of its understanding of simplicity, to mean that there cannot be any distinction, because distinction is plurality, there are no such thing as distinctions, and that the Father, you know, if God exists, he has to be ingenerate for him to be the first thing to be, kind of, in, in that sense. Um and since the father is ingenerate, the son, by essence, is generate. And so they have two different different essences, right? The, the father's essence is ingenerate. The son's essence is generate. Therefore, uh, the son is created while the father is not. So this is kind of the wave of uh, the first Hellenism. And by the way, if you want a greater analysis and a refutation of these things, there's a History of Christian Theology playlist that gets into this. What I'm kind of showing here is where these people got their views from the philosophical standpoint. Second wave of Hellenism uh, is where we kind of start to see more Christological errors too. So we, first we had Sabellianism, which is another Trinitarian heresy, which since God is one substance and there's some form of plurality, this one substance has three different modes of existing. And <clears throat> what do they mean? What does it mean by modes of existence? Well, uh, it doesn't, it means that <clears throat> It seemingly has three persons, but not in reality. Whereas Apollinarianism is where we kind of get 
get into the usage of substance, accident, etc. in Christology. And for Apollinarius, since substance is something that is self-subsistent and Christ is human and God, well, one of those substances how to be incomplete. Well, the, the divine substance cannot be incomplete. So it's the human substance in Christ that has to be incomplete in order and completed by the divine substance in order for Christ to remain one person while being fully God and fully man. So in the case of Apollinarius, he denied that Christ had a soul. But the third wave of Hel Hellenism kind of understood that Apollinarianism wasn't good enough. And it went into these two extreme directions of Nestorianism and Monophysitism. Nestorianism argues there is two substances, and so there have to be two self-subsistent beings. Monophysitism, on the other hand, starting from Christ being one person, says that Christ has to be one substance that is composed of a divine nature and human nature. So it is different from Apollinarianism in the sense that they will say that Christ's human nature is complete. Now, we will see here that there's an alternative third Hellenistic views trying to combat this. Now, Orthodox theology combats these heresies by rejecting their presuppositions, showing them to be illogical, and completely transcending the system that they put themselves in, these dichotomies they put themselves in. The third Hellenism alternatives try to answer the problems of third Hellenism which, with more Hellenism. So we see this in Pamphilus and Theodore of Rights, especially if you read Johannes Zakuber's uh, book, the rise of Christian theology and the end of ancient metaphysics, these views become much, much more clearer. For Pamphilus uh, and Theodore of Raitu, and Theodore of Raitu especially was a monotelite, um, they will respond by saying that the human nature of Christ is some sort of a quasi-accident. So it's not a substance, because there are, there are two people, but... It's not really an accident either. It's a quasi-accident. So it's a substance, but not really. And you can kind of see, you know, like it, it sounds like I'm kind of like straw manning them or making it up, but that's kind of literally what their position was. I mean, that, and for Theodore of Right, it makes a lot of sense because if Christ's human nature is not a substance, then it, the human nature of Christ does not have its own volition, which leads to monotelitism and monoenergism, which Theodore was a monotelite. He was a monotelite, and he was criticized by St. Maximus the Confessor uh, for this view. And then we have Origenist Christology at, uh, at the time of the Fifth Ecumenical Council, which argued that Christ is a tertium quid, a, a special combination, a third object that is composed of the two substances. Right, so again... Just more Hellenistic errors here. Fourth Hellenism, uh, you have Tritheism and Damian of Alexandria's response to Tritheism. Now, Damian of Alexandria was a Monophysite uh, bishop. And Tritheism, especially, it was promoted by people like John Ascutzangis and John Philoponus, who argued that since God is three substances, there are uh, since God is three persons and they are self-subsistent persons, God is three substances. That's kind of what the argument uh, leads to. So they're kind of applying uh, the logic that third Hellenists use in Christology to the Trinity. And they arrive to the conclusion of Tritheism. Now, of course, Tritheism isn't just something from the 5th, 6th century. It existed beforehand, but it really became a severe problem in the in the 6th and 7th centuries. Uh, more particularly to the Monophysite camp for that for this very reason. And Damien of Alexander's response to Tritheism is treating the persons of the Trinity like accidents, or you can call them quasi-accidents, because Damien, in many places in his response to Peter of Antioch, uh, makes a severe separation and distinction between God and the three persons of the Trinity. So one of the things he says that the each person in... Uh, you know, calling each person God is in fact wrong. You can't really do something like that. And so God, the term God refers to the, the substance and the persons referred are accidents of the Trinity that participate in the divine substance. Uh, so we have seen some of the Hellenistic errors being manifested in Christian history. And as I said, if you want to, you know, you can you can notice that I don't I'm not really citing much 
reason why I'm not citing much is that they're cited in my previous video. So if you want to see proof for them, you can you can check again History of Christian Theology series. I put the proof there and the direct quotations. This is kind of just a summary and an overview of what these people say and, and the positions that they have promoted using secular philosophy. The orthodox solution is to kind of define these terms in an ecclesial manner instead of just importing the meanings without questioning from secular traditions. So for example, uh, substance, which in this sense is kind of, you know, the same, has the same meaning of universal, uh, which can be considered as the very nature of a reality that bears the faculties and the, the properties and that it exists fully in each of its hypotheses. So we kind of see something, a distinction between a particular and a universal, whereas before the particular and the universal really weren't distinct, so to speak. Some people will say that a, that a particular, a universal is just a collection of all of that class's particulars. Some people will say that a particular is no different than a universal. The only difference is that it's just instantiated, right? It's concretized and it has marks that differentiate it from others. Then we have power, the, 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 the term power. You can see this in uh, Michel Barnes, The Power of God, and in, in uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa's theology. Power is the volition and movement of substance which marks what the substance is. And power is also synonymous with the term energy. Uh, the difference between power and energy is that power is the capacity of acting. Energy is the actualized acting, right? So the power to create and creating, you know, it's the same power, it's the same capacity. But the difference is between having the capacity to create and actually creating, right? Creating is an activity you do uh, that you will to do, whereas power is not something, it's something that you can will to do, basically. You can think of it this way, and it, and it marks the nature. It's the same thing with human beings. We have certain powers proper to our nature that we can act on. Uh, whether we decide to act on it at that time or not is dependent on us deciding to do so. And then there's hypostasis, which really deserves a video on its own in the future, which I plan to do a present, a larger presentation, but in short, uh, hypostasis is the is the mode of existence that particularizes really all all of these things that we're talking about, right? So it particularizes substance and its faculties and the properties in a unique way. So it is the instantiation of the substance, but it's not merely the instantiation of the universe. And this is kind of very important to understand: is that it is not reduced to what it does or what it accomplishes or what you observe it doing. It is, in fact, much more than that. In fact, its characteristic is, as I said, uniqueness. And it's different from the things that it particularizes, even though it can be identified as the things that it particularizes. You can talk about, talk about this in relation to human beings, right? Human beings acquire certain characteristics over time, but they don't change as persons. They still have the same exact identity. Right? But they individuate certain things. So for example, you know, five years ago, six years ago, ago, I was not a YouTuber. Right? That's an example I use a lot. Um, but now, you, you know, I am a unique kind of a YouTuber, not in a in a clue, like just in a general sense, but like in is in the sense that I have my own channel and I can't it's not something that I can share with other people. Right? So I can't make I can't make, for example, I just want to use an example. I can't make Cobain 52, the real Medvar. I just can't, you know, that's just not possible, even though we both do the same thing, right? So that's something that differentiates us. Even being a YouTuber is something that differentiates between us and between others. But it doesn't change who we are, it describes who we are, right? It helps you come closer to know who we are, but is it something that you can write on a piece of paper and say, I have documented exactly, completely, who David is, absolutely not. You can collect all personal attributes and characteristics that I have uniquely in my person. You will still, and you can you can characterize my nature and all that kind of stuff. You will still not be able to know who exactly I am. That is something, knowing something like that is something that is beyond philosophy and can only be accomplished with communion. 
with a proper communication between two sides. And in fact, funnily enough, we have communion. We have the Eucharist. We commune with God, right? We have many ways of communing with God that is truly knowing God, who God is. And just because we know God is a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, doesn't mean that we know everything about God, right? And, you know, you can say, well, we don't know everything about Him essentially, but also personally. We know something about Him personally, some things we don't, right? And so I will kind of summarize the, the Orthodox theology, which uses, again, these terms, but not the concepts, not the Hellenic secular concepts behind it. We will then see that the that the Trinity is one God in three persons. How is that possible? Well, the universal nature of divinity exists in each of the persons f fully, without separation. And even it will, you know, so the universal subsists in the particular. And this applies to human beings too. The universal of humanity subsists in each of the particulars, right? So for example, my body and my soul is going to be different than yours, but that relates to how uniquely we particularize it. We still share the same nature. I have a body, I have a soul. You have a body, you have a soul. We still share the same nature and thus we share the full essential marks of the nature. Of the same exact nature as man. And so uh, the universal divine nature, you could say, right, fully exists in each of the divine particulars. But they have particular marks or hypostatic properties that distinguish them from other people. The difference I will say between kind of like the human analogy and the and the, the person of the Trinity, because some people will say, well, you know, each of the human persons have, have will different things, right? They use their faculties in a different way, but the person of the Trinity don't do that. Well, that's because God does not have separation, right? So separation is not something that is proper to uh, the divine nature, the divine life even, it is something that is proper to, according to St. Maximus, the confessor, the fallen life, the fallen mode of being. And in Christology, thus, we have uh, Christ as one hypostasis that uniquely particularizes divine substance and human substance in him. So now he has two universal natures. Again, the universals subsist in particulars, and so these two universal natures subsist in a unique way in the person of Christ. And this is why he mediates, he's the, media, he's the mediation between God and man. God and man are mediated in him. And the properties of these natures are manifested in his person. And uh, he, his two natures have their own marks and their own volition. So Christ has a human volition and a divine volition too. But there's only one person who moves the moves the natures, so to speak, right? So there are two movements, but there's one mover, and the person is the one who's moving uh, the nature in that unique manner. And so, although Christ, uh, in his person, bears the full names of each nature and their properties, he's not ultimately reduced to his nature and properties, even though we can call him by his natures and and properties. He's not just those things. He's more than that. Right? If he was just those things, then hypostasis will just be synonyms of nature and property. But we will fall into the same exact errors that we see here. Right? So how do we not fall into the same, same errors? As St. John Damascus says, we uh, all heresies in, in their roots come from failing to distinguish between nature and person that is nature and hypostasis or physis and hypostasis. You know, you can think of it in their Greek terms as well. So having said all of this, this should summarize Christianity's combat with secular Hellenistic philosophy throughout history. Again, what I've stated here in these waves of Hellenism, again, these are very... So this, this is absolutely not exhaustive. They are much more nuanced than the way they're presented here. The reason why they're presented in this very simple way is to summarize and to give you a brief idea and a summary of what these views were and the, the concepts behind it and the motivation behind these views, these philosophical, I suppose, movements and uh, ultimately heresies.
and there are many different great works and even videos that explore, uh, whether they're from me or whether they're from other people, that explores these things in a much more nuanced manner. So um, hopefully it was helpful for you and uh, hopefully it got the cocks turning, so to speak. And I will see you all in the next video. Thank you for watching. Uh, may God be with you all. See you all in the next video. Goodbye.